as we celebrate the 40th anniversary of the Turtles this week, I'm excited to revisit what's likely still one of the best TMNT stories to date, City at War. This epic saga not only marked the end of an era for the Turtles, but also powerfully encapsulated the themes of vengeance, redemption, identity, and responsibility that began in 1984 with the very first issue of Volume 1. In more ways than one, Return to New York and City at War encapsulated what could be considered the peak of the Turtles' popularity, Turtle Mania. As Turtle Mania began to wane, the creators of the Turtles, Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird, were busy establishing a new team at Mirage Comics, both administrative and artistic, aiming to return operations to basics. Overwhelmed by the impact of Turtle Mania in 1992, they decided it was time to conclude a chapter. They were set to provide a fitting end to the saga they'd begun eight years earlier. The last time they worked together was for Return to New York. In this story, the Turtles finally put an end to the Shredder and their exile from the city. However, there was still one more story to tell. Following the Shredder's death, a power vacuum had engulfed the underworld of New York. The Foot Clan, an organization with deep roots in Japan, found itself in disarray, leaderless and chaotic, thrusting New York into turmoil. Wanting to do more than just produce a special 50th issue, which they had planned to write and pencil together, the creators aimed to turn the world of these characters upside down. They intended to break the characters apart to allow them to grow and reach a new status quo that, in retrospect, aligned closer to how the turtles were depicted in other media especially regarding the theme of responsibility. They envisioned a 15-issue story arc, starting with a prequel, titled Shades of Grey, then followed by the 13 issues of City at War, which would conclude Volume 1 of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and begin a new volume in color, penned by Jim Lawson. The duo only worked together on issue 50, with the remainder of the saga penciled by Jim Lawson and covers by A.C. Farley. The overall plot was thought by Kevin and Peter, but the actual scripts were written by Peter and Jim. After many tryouts, ink duties went to Keith Eichen, Matt Banning, and Jason Temujin Minor. In the prequel story Shades of Grey, during an exercise in the town of Springfield, Casey Jones ran into some thugs, and in an act of self-defense, killed one of them. Springfield's vigilante, Nobody, found him next to the body and assumed the worst. Thanks to the Turtles' intervention, Nobody let Casey go. Meanwhile, April was supposed to pick them up after the exercise, but her car broke down, leaving her stranded on the road. Fortunately, a man on a motorcycle came to her rescue, and the two had a nice, unusually normal moment. Having a romantic interest would have been ideal for April, but her life was far from ordinary. From the moment she met the Turtles, she was swept into their cycle of revenge against the Foot Clan, a cycle that cost her her home and any chance at a social life. Bringing innocent people into this cycle of revenge wouldn't have been just or fair. April shared part of this story on the phone with her older sister, Robin. She lived on the West Coast, was divorced, and had a kid named Trevor. From April's perspective, Robin led a carefree life that April envied. Feeling frustrated, she sought out her only father figure at the farmhouse, Master Splinter. She told him that sometimes she wished she had a normal life. Splinter, grappling with his own frustrations, suggested she leave and abruptly slammed the door behind him. Casey was also going through the guilt of having killed that young thug, which prevented him from offering April the support she needed. This solidified April's feelings of isolation and convinced her to try to break away from this life and go live with her sister in California. Casey had problems dealing with his guilt and tried to channel it by starting a fight with Donatello, which he obviously lost. When Casey and nobody crossed paths again, the vigilante confirmed, after interrogating the other thugs, that Casey acted in self-defense. But this was something Casey already knew and did nothing to alleviate his guilt. Ashamed of his actions, he threw away his mask. Meanwhile, the Turtles received alarming news from New York. Gangs were at war, 
causing widespread death and destruction across Manhattan. It had become clear that the single act of violence from Nagi to Shen had evolved into a full-blown civil war, leading to an increasing loss of innocent lives. With the rest of their family on their own journeys, which I will cover later, the Turtles decided to close down the farm and return to the city to fix the mess they allowed to escalate when they killed the Shredder and left a power vacuum in the criminal underworld. Without a leader, the Foot Clan split into three factions. The Shredder's personal elite guard who were fanatically devoted to him, the Foot Scientists, a tech division who were also skilled martial artists, their strength was in the creation of high-tech weapons. And finally, the Foot Accountants, who ran the financial operations of the clan in New York and were also skilled martial artists. While powerful in their own right, these last two factions lacked strategic foresight. Without a unifying leader, the factions struggled to coordinate, each driven by disparate priorities. The most menacing among them were the Shredder Elite Guard, still adhering fiercely to the Shredder's legacy of vengeance. They began targeting other foot soldiers who were already engaged in internal conflicts. Many innocent bystanders were caught in this conflict. One of them was an immigrant who lived on top of an adult shop. The shop was blown up by one of these factions, and the old man would end up in the hospital. I'll circle back to this character later. Knowing that the sewers weren't safe, the turtles returned to the city and moved into an empty water tower. They were feeling responsible for this escalation of violence. Killing the Shredder only generated more chaos, and now the whole city was engulfed in the perpetual cycle of revenge. For Raphael, it was clear that it was their responsibility to fix the situation. However, Leonardo wasn't convinced yet that they should interfere. After all, this wasn't their fight, and they'd never sought out trouble before. Raphael argued that their training specifically prepared them to combat the Foot Clan, making them uniquely qualified to intervene. Despite Raphael's practical approach, the Turtles soon realized that they were out of their depth. Merely patrolling the streets was insufficient. Tensions escalated when the accountants, in a bold move, hacked the power company to cut off the foot scientists from their power source. The scientists retaliated by deploying giant robots against a bus carrying one foot accountant. This was one of the most notorious conflicts in the war. The turtles found themselves in the middle of the battle between the two factions and a group of foot soldiers. This quickly escalated when the elite guard showed up increasing the bloodbath until the police interfered and dispersed them. This traumatic experience was enough for Leonardo to realize that Raphael's approach wasn't the solution to this problem. It only added fuel to the fire and exacerbated the chaos. Order was needed amidst this chaos, and the answer lay on the other side of the world, in Japan. There, Karai, the head of the Japanese branch of the Foot Clan, was monitoring the unfolding chaos in New York. Karai represented a type of leadership starkly different from the Shredders. She was pragmatic and open to negotiation, the kind of leader who could reunify the fragmented Foot Clan and end the ongoing war. Deciding to take matters into her own hands, Karai traveled to New York to restore peace through consolidation of power. But the real challenge for her would be the elite guard, who continued escalating violence against the Foot Scientists. In a significant conflict, the Turtles defeated an elite who, failing to avenge his master, committed seppuku. But after this encounter, the Turtles didn't cover their tracks, and the Japanese ninjas traced them to the empty water tower, forced them out, and captured Leonardo. During their escape, the other Turtles received a message from Karai containing her phone number. After a brief call, the Turtles met with Karai. She explained how the clan let Shredder run rampant because of his excellent reputation as a soldier. However, once the New York branch became too powerful, the Japanese branch lost its influence over them. Following the Shredder's death, the Japanese branch was prepared to manage a smooth transition of power, but the constant infighting among the factions hindered these plans. This turmoil was a reflection of the type of leader the Shredder had been, domineering and divisive. In this dire situation, the Japanese branch was hoping for one side to remain victorious, but the conflict was now so destructive that news of it was reaching mainstream media. 
Karai's first step in restoring order was to eliminate the elites. They were too loyal to the Shredder, and were a significant threat to the Japanese branch. The Turtles felt at odds with all of this. They were responsible for escalating the conflict, but they didn't have a clear reason to interfere. Karai then offered them a truce to put their minds finally at ease. If they helped them kill off the Shredder's elite guard, the foot would never trouble them again. Not knowing if Karai's word was something to be trusted, the Turtles decided to take some time to think about it. But not too much time, as the Elite found Karai's soldiers and put their hands on all the intel they had about the Turtles. Perhaps inspired by Karai's pragmatism, the Turtles started reflecting on their motivations. The Foot Clan wasn't their enemies. They only fought against them because it was Splinter's revenge plan against Oroku Saki for killing his master Yoshi. This was their opportunity to stop the cycle of vengeance and finally live in peace. To do this would mean to break free from their master's wishes. Mikey, who didn't see things in black and white, sided with Leo, and they quickly went back to Karai with an answer. However, upon their arrival, they found the place had been under attack by the elite, and Karai was grieving over her daughter's dead body. Now let's pause to focus on the journey of the rest of the cast, starting with a new character named Nathaniel Arbushiev, an elderly immigrant who lived above the adult video shop. It was never specified exactly where he was from, but the context suggests he might have been Yugoslavian. Since the first chapter of the saga had very little dialogue in it, Kevin and Peter used the immigrant watching his homeland being ripped apart by civil war as a way to narrate the events of the issue. This feeling of your home breaking apart also resonated with the plots of Casey, April, and Splinter as they embarked on their own individual adventures. The dissolution of the Soviet Union served as a metaphor for the death of the Shredder, the catalyst for the war in New York, and this, in turn, destabilized his homeland in the Balkans, mirroring real-world conflicts. Peter Laird didn't want to create fake countries for this conflict, as he found it goofy whenever DC Comics would create countries like Karak. And you can tell by the news followed by the old man that they were inspired by the Siege of Sarajevo. The various factions within the clan symbolized the independence movements in the Baltic Republics. For almost the entirety of the story, Nathaniel spent his time recovering at the hospital, listening to news from his homeland. These would mirror the events happening in New York, I'll come back to Nathaniel and the meaning of his journey later in this video. Let's move to Splinter's journey. I mentioned earlier that he was frustrated, and it all had to do with the errors of his ways. His initial quest for revenge against the Shredder had set off a chain of death and destruction. But from his point of view, this vengeance was fulfilled early on and then again after the Turtles defeated the Shredder clone, and none of this seemed to bring him peace. If anything, it made his life feel utterly devoid of meaning. Perhaps because his mind was once fueled by violence, Splinter now struggled to meditate and achieve enlightenment. He left the farmhouse, hoping that reconnecting with nature would help him find new meaning in life, but this effort proved fruitless. He wandered until he encountered the abandoned facility where the Turtles had once battled the Rat King. While investigating this eerie place, looking for clues from the universe, he fell into the same silo the Rat King fell into before, and upon landing, broke his leg. Trapped with no way out and unable to move, Splinter started talking to the Rat King, who was still there after all this time. The Rat King advised him to survive by eating rats, otherwise the rats would end up eating him. Splinter rejected the idea. He would have done something like that back when he was a rat, but he was no longer a beast. He was an enlightened being. In a way, Splinter wasn't being pragmatic and was putting morality over survival. As weeks passed, Splinter faced starvation. This dire situation finally forced him to relent to his basic survival instincts. He killed and ate a rat, which marked the beginning of his physical recovery. Two months passed by, and Splinter started improving. The Rat King was pleased with the lesson that Splinter had learned. He told him that the beliefs he was holding onto were blinding him, 
and the walls in his mind, like the ones in the silo, were blocking out the light of knowledge. Being a mutant with the psyche of a human, Splinter needed to be humbled by his beastly origins to relearn what really mattered in life. This humbling experience was what he needed to begin healing, especially as his quest for vengeance had inadvertently harmed innocents like April. Splinter recovered and was able to leave the place, but before climbing up, he found the remains of the Rat King, who'd been dead all along. Was this a hallucination or a ghost? You can check my Rat King video to learn more about this mystery. Splinter climbed out of the silo and returned to nature, but his story isn't over yet. I'll return to him later. As hinted at earlier, Casey embarked on a journey of redemption. After failing to reach April before her departure, he went after her. But on his way to the west coast, he stopped at a grill house in Goathead, Colorado, where he met Gabrielle. The two flirted a bit, but after having dinner, Casey returned to his car, where he was attacked by the comic book adaptations of Steve Levine and Eric Talbot. Casey, being so proud of his car, should have smashed the two attackers. But still feeling guilty for killing that kid in an act of self-defense, Casey was unable to fight back, and the two criminals stole his car. Gabrielle came out to help him and heal his wounds. Stuck in Colorado, Casey stayed at Gabrielle's trailer. He tried reporting the theft of his car to the police, but saying the words was just too painful to his ego. It's possible that Casey had rationalized this experience as punishment for the violent actions of his past. Accepting the place fate brought him to, Casey stayed with Gabrielle, and the two started a romantic relationship, completely abandoning his trip to the west coast to get April back. One day, Gabrielle revealed to him that she was pregnant from a previous boyfriend. This man's identity was revealed in Volume 3 of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which would later be declared non-canon. Gabrielle postponed telling Casey because she assumed he would leave her. To her surprise, Casey accepted her as she was and decided to marry her. But starting a new life proved as complicated for Casey as it was for April, and he got fired after fighting with his boss. The day Gabrielle went into labor, Casey waited for several hours at the hospital. This gave him time to fall asleep and dream about a hulking figure that looked like him, a monster who would fight back to prevent his car from getting stolen, but also the kind of person who would kill a kid in a fight. This figure tried to take Gabrielle and his car away from him. This dream took a twisted turn when he realized Gabrielle was April, and she was crying on a park bench. I already explored Casey's alter ego in another video. Tragically, Gabrielle died due to complications during childbirth, leaving Casey as the sole guardian of their newborn daughter, whom he named Shadow. If Casey was looking for punishment for his past sins, losing his wife was probably it. He returned to the grill where he met her, and witnessed his former car arrive. He went out and fought for it, knocking down his attackers and even Inky, their dog, who I already talked about in another video. Casey recovered his car, took Shadow with him, and went back to his mother's building in New York, where we learned Casey's real name was Arnold, an easter egg for Mirage artist Arnold Craig Farley. This character arc was quite revealing, because he was always presented as a grown child to the readers. But his path to redemption showed us he was capable of guilt and responsibility, something the Turtles were also struggling to come to terms with. April left Northampton to live with her sister on the west coast. This was her chance to escape from the chaos of her life with the Turtles. Like the immigrant, she traveled west, seeking a new start and a normal life away from conflict. Unfortunately, Robin's laid-back lifestyle and lackadaisical approach to housekeeping clashed with April's need for order and stability. Robin attempted to uplift her spirits by engaging her in typical social activities like going to bars, but April, accustomed to constant danger, found no joy in these pursuits. Her prolonged anxiety, fueled by fears of the clan's retaliation, prevented her from relaxing. Still, she tried to blend in and found a programming job thanks to Colin, Robin's ex-husband, who she realized was just trying to sexually harass her. Work wasn't good, and her love life was also subpar. April's need for control was incompatible with Robin's chaotic lifestyle, 
reaffirming her sense that she genuinely belonged back in New York. Things reached a climax when she received a call from a retirement home and found out that her dad had passed away. This news forced her to confront her unresolved issues in New York and reassess her priorities. April was irrevocably tied to the Turtles, their world, and most importantly, to her other father figure. This ordeal helped her come to terms with the direction her life had taken. She realized that the Turtles and Splinter were her true family, providing her with the connection and purpose she'd been missing. But before returning, their lawyer called April and Robin to tell them that they had inherited $200,000 each. This gave April the means to perhaps start anew this time on her own terms. Going back to the New York plot, the O'Neill sisters were visiting what was left of the old second time around store, not knowing that the Turtles and Karai were hiding inside. Karai was now wearing the Shredder suit to confuse the elite guards. Karai used the Shredder's influence to convince one of them to commit seppuku, but the other four were wiser. Soon, a battle between Karai, the Turtles, and the Elite ensued. In the final fight, Donnie broke his leg and had to use a machine gun to save Karai from an Elite. Leo killed the last Elite, and with this gesture, the Turtles were finally free from the shadow of the Shredder and the cycle of vengeance that started with Oroku Nagi. Karai would stay in New York to reorganize the New York branch and later return to Japan to spread her daughter's ashes on Asana Bay. Meanwhile, April was trying to invest her inheritance in real estate, which led her to discover the building owned by Casey's mother. This building, comprising six apartments and a two-room studio in the basement where Casey resided, was up for sale, as Casey's mother wished to relocate to Florida, weary from years of property management following her husband's death. While inspecting the basement, April discovered that Casey was the woman's son. April bought the building and became the landlord, after reconciling with Casey and meeting Shadow, they returned to Northampton to pick up some things before moving back to the city permanently. There, they reunited with Leo, Raph, and Mikey, but she was intrigued about the whereabouts of Splinter and Donnie. The Turtles took them to a cave where the two were living now. Donnie told them that he planned on staying with Master Splinter while he healed, and he wouldn't be joining his brothers in their return to the city. Kevin and Peter did this because they were planning to put Donnie on a journey of spiritualism, and they always considered him to be the one with the strongest relationship with Splinter. Splinter vanished into the shadows before April could say goodbye to him. The Turtles tried to justify it by saying that something happened to him recently that he hadn't been able to speak about yet. April lamented this, said goodbye to Donnie, and returned to the farm. After leaving the forest, April looked back and assumed Splinter was following them in the shadows. Perhaps guilty of how his actions changed April's life, or because of the way he treated her the last time they saw each other. April talked in the direction of the forest, and said that her biological father had just died. He was the father who raised her and taught her how to be a good person. But in the last few years, she felt like she had two fathers, and she loved them both. Having recently learned about the dangers of keeping a closed mind, Splinter came out from the shadows, called April, his daughter, and the two hugged, making peace. In the context of this story, this hug can be seen as another step towards peace and redemption. A cycle of peace and redemption, if you will. But what happened to the immigrant? After being discharged from the hospital, he had no place to live, so he moved into a state-funded retirement home. Unlike April, he couldn't return to his war-torn homeland, so he had no option but to continue trying to make the best of his new life in New York. City at War is a story that's dense in themes and character arcs, something that comic books often overlook. One theme is the burden of leadership. With the Shredder gone, the Foot Clan fragmented and struggled to find direction mirroring the leadership vacuum left among the Turtles and Splinter. The Shredder's death not only deprived the Turtles of a clear enemy, but also compelled them to reconsider their roles beyond mere fighters. This crisis of purpose forced them to confront their self-perceptions and responsibilities. Karai emerged as a pivotal figure in this chaos, exemplifying pragmatic leadership. 
Her efforts to consolidate power and forge necessary alliances contrasted sharply with the Turtles' initial view of their roles as mere tools for combat. Her actions underscored the burdens and responsibilities of leadership, themes that resonated deeply with the Turtles' eventual realization of their broader duties in the world. Another central theme is vengeance. I feel like this is the most obvious one in the story. But tying it to the previous theme, it's not a crazy coincidence that it took a pragmatist to break the cycle of revenge. This pragmatism also enlightens Splinter, helps April realize where she belongs, and helps Casey rebuild his life. For the Turtles, finally breaking free of the cycle of revenge freed them to lead new lives, now with a more responsible point of view about their actions. The story explores identity and belonging, particularly through characters like April and Nathaniel, who find themselves caught between worlds. Nathaniel, unable to return to his war-torn homeland, must forge a new existence in New York, while April confronts her sense of identity through her turbulent interactions and her final acceptance of her life with the Turtles as her true family. The Turtles themselves face an identity crisis, raised to be weapons of vengeance against the Shredder. This singular focus left them unprepared for a life beyond their mission, leading to a pivotal moment where they must evaluate the consequences of their upbringing and actions. This crisis forces them to question not only their motivations, but also the ethical implications of their past deeds. If they were raised like soldiers, were they responsible for the fallout of their actions? Over the years, tie-in stories were added to City at War, thanks to the Tales of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles book. I already talked about the story of the Mistress in another video, which worked as some sort of prequel to the saga. Unfortunately, the story was never completed, but check the video if you're interested in knowing how it connected to City at War. Another story that took place in the middle of City at War was Temps, which showed us the other side of the conflict through a Foot Ninja's little brother's perspective. Despite sharing credit for City at War, Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird only worked directly together on issue 50, marking their final collaboration on a comic book, aside from their joint efforts on the covers for TMNT Volume 2. After City at War, Kevin devoted most of his energies to other endeavors, including running the indie publisher Tundra and establishing a museum dedicated to comics. His last project directly related to TMNT was Body Count, he wouldn't return to actively pencil the Turtles until 2011, when IDW recruited him as a story consultant and artist for a new series, rekindling his involvement with the characters he co-created. Peter Laird, on the other hand, stepped away from the Turtles comics until the early 2000s, when he acquired the rights from Kevin and initiated TMNT Volume 4 and the 2003 animated series. The two wouldn't share story credits again until an old idea of theirs was resurrected by Tom Waltz. That idea was The Last Ronin. It's a story that quickly became a best-selling graphic novel and is now expected to be adapted into video games and a live-action movie. So, do you think this is the best TMNT comic book saga ever? Or do you have another candidate? Share your thoughts below. Thanks for watching. See you in the sewers.